Most people don't realize that methane emissions actually are, are coming from the front end of the cow. They're not coming from the back end. Um, so, you know, the, the belching portion of that. And when we put cattle on a green finished diet, it changes the, the profile of the, we're basically feeding fatty acids in the rumen and it changes what they emit. And they actually emit less methane on a grain finishing diet than they do on a grass finishing diet. Um, so there's, there's a couple interesting nuances that, you know, if somebody's not involved in the day-to-day -day of cattle world, um, may not fully understand. Okay, welcome Kara Smith. Thank you for coming back. Good to see you again. It's always nice to see from our fellow ranching folks, the folks that feed us. And so for those who don't know, I mean, you've been out here once before and we've had Jeff on, I think twice now. So this will be your second time. You're, a, I guess, a relatively new mom and cattle person, cattle agri new cattle nutrition expert, I guess, right? Kira, tell us, tell us who you are again. Yes. Well, I, I basically have, have kind of lived and breathed the cattle industry my whole life. That's uh, what happens when you grow up on a fifth generation ranch. Uh, we're now raising the sixth generation with our two girls. Uh, they're one's two and a half and the other one's almost eight months old. So, um, but yeah, I've, I've been, been in Northeast Colorado, um, took some other stents, other places for school. So I have a bachelor's degree in animal science and then a master's in ruminant nutrition in the cow nutrition space. So uh, focused in on nutrition and health and that kind of interface of what that looks like. Uh, but basically, yes, I've, I've lived and breathed the cattle industry my whole life and ranching and, you know, the Western way of life, et cetera. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I, I look forward to the conversation. Yeah, and I just hopefully that sixth generation will yield a seventh and an eighth and a ninth and a tenth generation on and on. I hope so for my future generations, because I think, you know, as you know, the cattle industry is under a lot of pressure uh, in many ways, uh, you know, as far as, you know, people demonizing you guys as evil people that, you know, get your jollies out of torturing animals to the fact that you're destroying the planet and all this sort of nonsense. Um, it's interesting, you know, there's a lot of, well, there's a lot of, I guess, discussion around cattle nutrition, but very, very little, I think, true expertise is out there. You know, we hear about people talking about, oh, my God, how dare you feed cows uh, some corn? They're going to die and bloat and turn into diabetics and you're torturing. So, I mean, I mean, what's the reality on cows? And are they getting sick? And uh, because that's something I think is, is interesting. I know I'm going to talk with another fellow maybe by the name of Max Winders, who is in the Midwest. He has a uh, better fed beef company. He's been doing it for 35 years and they, you know, they finish their cattle on grain and they, you know, he wants to talk about that, but can you shed some light on, because there's a lot of misconceptions around there. Cattle, I mean, I mean, cause I know you guys finish both. I think you guys finish out on both. If I'm not mis mistaken, or maybe you can enlighten me on that. Yes. Yeah. Well, we, we definitely have. Um, one of the beauties of a cow and, and that's part of the reason, well, that is the reason that we run cattle on the ranch we have here is because it's not made for row crop farming. I mean, it is made for that ruminant to be able to take the grasses that really we don't have a ton of other uses for. You know, people aren't looking to move out here and, and build subdivisions uh, just by the nature of where we live. Um, and then the, the farming side of it is not great because of our water supply. So this ruminant it, animal can take these grasses and make it, you know, the highest quality protein that we have available. So I call it their superpower, frankly. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a cow nerd and a cow lover by heart, but those are, that's one of the biggest pieces of what a cow can do. And the majority of their lives is spent on grass. Um, so they can change that grass into the protein that we all love. Uh, but we, we do finish on, on grain as well, because um, that is where the flavor profile comes from, you know, the, the grain finished beef that, that we're all accustomed to. Uh, but from, you know, the, the health and welfare side of it, it's just like everything, there's, there's a balance. So what we're doing when we finish cattle on a grain diet is we're shortening that window that it takes for animals to get to that biological end point to be able to convert them into meat, into the protein uh, that we consume. So you're shortening that window. So it is, you know, it's a higher calorie diet. But we as you know, nutritionists in this field, we're always balancing you know, the health and the, the energy content of that 
diet that we're feeding to cattle. So we're, it's a hundred percent balanced for their energy needs, energy, protein, minerals, et cetera. Uh, so we're putting that all in, into one, to one delivery device, you know, on with a feed truck and putting that is what we call a total mixed ration in front of these cattle to, to be able to make sure that they have every nutrient available for them. And some of the misperceptions that are out there is, well, right now, the biggest one is, you know, the methane emissions. And most people don't realize that methane emissions actually are, are coming from the front end of the cow. They're not coming from the back end. Um, so, you know, the, the belching portion of that. And when we put cattle on a green finished diet, it changes the, the profile of the, we're basically feeding fatty acids in the rumen, and it changes what they emit. And they actually emit less methane on a grain finishing diet than they do on a grass finishing diet. Um, so there's there's a couple interesting nuances that you know somebody's not involved in the day to day of cattle world um, may not fully understand. So yeah, that, that's one of the reasons you know back in the I guess out in the 1970s when when the sort of the intensive style of farm or you know raising cattle came into came into effect they saw reductions in water usage land usage methane emissions by something like 30 or 40 percent or something like that over the years and most people don't realize that the methane the methanogenic uh bacteria in the room and prefer the forest the grasses to make more methane and so that's something now a lot of people will, will contend that it's offset by the the soil sequestration by grass finishing and again that depends on how you grass finish it. if you if you rotate them versus just turning them out in the field for six months and they chew up all the all the land but let me ask you about um, the other thing. I've been on. I've been to several feedlots, and you know, I've seen the, the the ration they're eating. It's not just a bunch of corn. I mean, it's it's, it's all it's it's a little. I mean, there's, it's 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 nothing I would ever want to eat. Um, and so, I mean, what is like a like? Let's say you know they're and you said three months, four months in a feedlot, something like that's pretty typical. If I'm, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, what are they? I mean, what is the whole nature of their food eating? It's not just they're eating ears of corn, right? I mean, what are they doing? No, it's um, typically where we live. Corn is the, the primary energy source because it's readily available. Um, you know, we're, we're pretty darn close to the corn belt and there's a lot of corn that's grown here where we are. So we talk, you know, environmental footprint. We're not having to truck that corn a long ways to be able to feed the cattle. Um, and, and there's different processes that help become the, the availability of the, you know, the corn that we're utilizing, but that's not uh, the entire piece of the ration. Of course, we have to have fiber in that ration to have enough scratch factor to keep the rumen at its highest functioning level. Um, so, you know, there's hay as well. Uh, we use some other byproducts where we live. Uh, we have some distillers, uh, distillers, the byproduct of ethanol here is, is readily available. So we utilize that. And it actually is a really good mix of, you know, the fiber as well as the energy content. Um, so we're, we're able to build in other pieces of that. You know, it's not just the whole corn that you're, you're feeding at, at that one point in time. Um, so those are those are all pieces that we get into the into the ration is we're, we're balancing them and, and we make sure that we keep the, you know, the rumen as healthy as possible, because that is and that's what they're thriving off of is we're basically feeding the bugs in that rumen of that animal to to keep them functioning at their highest level. So, yes, it's it is a blend. It's it's not just a 100 percent of you know, corn diet. So. Now, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but corn is grass, right? It's a type of grass, if, if I'm not mistaken. I believe corn is considered a type of grass and uh, the seed that is there born, born, the corn grains or things that, my understanding, I was told that if you turn out a cow in pasture and there's a corn field next to it, they'll go in the corn field and start eating, you know, on their own. Is that is that something you would see or is that just something that doesn't actually it happen? on the time of year um you know as far as cattle preference like this we're getting into our best grazing season here because of the cyclicity of where we live of course we have green growing lush grass when you know it comes spring into when our growing season stops with the first freeze so if if they're we just turn cattle out onto you know our green grass that's readily growing they're they're going to prefer that to about anything um you know if they had the ability to go into a cornfield they they may, but are they going to just go pick out the corn stalks on top, you know, on the top of, of that cornfield? Likely not. Um, but even it depends on the growing stage. So if it's in its boot stage and the, the corn is 
really small and easily to digest and consume, they're, they're likely going to going to prefer that. Um, so yes, it is, you know, it's, it gets to a stage and that it actually seeds and becomes a grain versus an actual forage. So, um, and there's a lot of nuances that happen within our, our world of, you know, the grass finish side, you know, you, you could graze different, you know, like a, a pea field or some others that are still technically a grass at that point, And they haven't headed out into a grain. Um, so that's, uh, there's some interesting nuances that, that could be had. Um, but basically what it's doing is increasing the energy content of, of each bite that a cattle or a cow would be consuming with a grain versus a forage. There, you, you mentioned the upcycling capacity, and I've heard the, the ratio is typically 0. 0.6 to 1. So for every six-tenths of a gram of human edible protein, they produce one gram of high-quality human edible protein. Is that, does that number hold up from what you see? Yeah, I'd say that'd be about right. Um, you know, we can get into a lot of the science that, you know, there's people in my field that have dedicated their lives to uh, of the greenhouse gas emission, the increasing the meat quality, et cetera, that like that is what they do every day. Um, those those aren't as well published as I would like them to be, but um, that is something that they continue to dedicate and and do research around. Because when we start talking about methane emissions, you know, in these countries that are 100% grass fed, compared to what we do in the U.S., the U.S. still has the the least amount of methane emissions compared to these other countries because of the way that we are able to finish cattle. Yeah, and then the other thing is that methane is a flow gas, and so it's you know it's turned in the in the carbon cycle naturally anyway. We've been doing that for you know since you know cows existed or cattle or any kind of grazing animals that existed. So it's something that I think a lot of people don't you know sort of understand that. Um, there's a uh, so the question about your corn is it GMO corn and what what is the concern around that or do you have a concern about that? I personally don't have a concern around that. Um, you know, Jeff actually is more on the on the seed and grain side, and he could speak to some of those things a little better than than I could. Typically, you know, the reasons that we have GMOs has come from our environmental conditions to help these crops thrive better in the conditions that they're in. Um, you know, that that is typically the reason that a GMO has come about, no matter what we are talking about. So um, that's, yeah, I, I don't have those concerns, especially when it comes to including them in, in a cattle diet. Yeah, I've got a question. Maybe you can answer it. I've read it a while ago and I can't remember where I found it. So I just want to know, there's a lot of people asking about, you know, glyphosate, you know, it's one of the, the roundup that's sprayed as an herbicide and do cattle bioaccumulate that? What happens when cattle come in contact with that? Cause it, it's in the environment in a lot of places. Do we know anything about what happens with cattle on that? So there are very few things that the cattle really bioaccumulate because what we're doing as a, a ruminant nutritionist is we're feeding those bugs in the rumen. It's not like us of what comes in, goes out or, you know, hogs or chickens with a simple stomach animal. We're really, we're feeding those, those bugs in that population. And then they are producing, you know, the vault fatty acids, et cetera, that, that go into that animal. So um, it, it's kind of, it's definitely hard to say that within a ruminant because we, they are changing what comes in to what goes out. Yeah, I, I read that they, they don't have, the, their physiology prevents any significant accumulation of that. So I, I know there's people that have a concern about that. And uh, I, you know, you know I, I tend not to. I mean, I, I tend to think these things are so small and min minuscule that there's bigger fish to fry, so to speak. Um, how has your, uh, I mean, how has your sort of uh, process evolved over the time? I don't, and I, I don't remember how many years you've been in here. Probably you can speak to your, your parents' generation. How are things evolved as far as nutrition is concerned, you know, within your, your, your particular ranch? As far as our cattle nutrition? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, well, a good story, actually, from my office, you can see an old uh, plow that, that sits in, in the front of our place because um, I, I moved it from my dad's when we moved back here. And it hadn't moved since the 70s because that was the last time that this place was plowed with my great grandpa and all of his, his horses that used to pull that team ran off with him. And that was where that plow stayed. He was like, we are not farming this place anymore. Um, so that was, that was the last time that any ground on our place was actually tilled. 
Um, and since then, it's been 100% grazing. I mean, that's cattle utilize our ground the most efficient way that they can, especially considering, you know, we're we're desert country, more or less. Um, our, our annual rainfall is, you know, 14 inches and less, depending on the year. So the the most efficient use that we have for for where we live is a grazing animal, and that's that's stayed pretty static since my dad took the ranch in in the mid 70s. Um, you know, we have developed different ways of utilizing and grazing as far as rotations. Uh, when you you know you move waters. You, you have cattle utilizing the ground more efficiently when they are able to graze to a water. Uh, placement of mineral feeders the same way is they'll, they'll utilize the ground more efficiently because they have to travel to go find their mineral or find the water um, versus, you know, staying heavily concentrated in one area, um, you know, and, and tromping down any, any ground in, in that spot. Uh, and that's the same way with the rotation as we we typically turn out a little earlier than some other places because we have forage that starts around this time, you know, by the middle of April. So we have what we call our, our cheat grass and that's our early season. And they we utilize that early season grasses on different parts of our ground differently because there's some pastures we have that grow more early season or you know more cool season and more warm season grasses. So we we rotate cattle accordingly on how best to utilize the ground that they are currently on. Well, and you mentioned minerals. I was on a I was in a ranch in North Carolina last fall, and the rancher he's a he's a big proponent of this regenerative style agriculture, but he had like a mineral feeder of just different potassium, magnesium, you know, there's like 20 different minerals he had out there. And the cows kind of selectively took what they wanted and he just saw that they would, you know, they would they would pick and choose what they want based on time of year and some of the things. Do you, I mean, how much does mineral supplementation play a role in cattle, cattle feed that, you, that you're, you're aware of? It, it starts playing more of a role uh, when forages aren't as high quality. Uh, so the middle of the summer here, we our profile, I've done quite a few analysis on our grass, and our mineral profile is pretty solid, uh, especially during the height of our grazing season. You start getting earlier or later, and then when grasses go dormant, that's when you really need to start supplementation, whether it's energy, protein, or some of your, your micronutrients, they, they do need to be supplemented. Um, but typically, we are, we're pretty pretty good in the height of our grazing season uh, but you you always keep that in mind whether you're out grazing or you're in you know a feed yard scenario of making sure that it is 100 percent balanced because when we start getting into issues with our micro minerals we can impact a lot of other things and that's something that we don't want to do and then uh, water is always a big a big key to that because we're on well water so you never know what minerals may be in that well water that could tie up other minerals and have an impact on health. Um, so we make sure we have analysis on our water as well. So we're balancing that with what we need to supplement. Yeah, there, there's a question about the breed of cattle you use. And I know I, know I had it when Jeff, Jeff, you know, as you probably know, Jeff came out and visited me out here at my house a, a back a few months ago. And um, one of the discussions that, that we got into, he's talking about the fact you guys typically use steer steers as your as your meat production. And there's and I didn't know this. I mean, he taught me this that uh, the 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 steer or the male, you know, the the neutered male cows are castrated males tend to pr produce better quality meat, perhaps or better marbling or something like that. What is a, what is the breed you guys use? Why do you use it? And what's is there? Can you elaborate on the why you use males? Yeah, so we're we're typically an Angus based cow herd. Um, so when you know those are more the English type breeds. When you start mixing in the continental type type breeds, so that'd be like you know a Charlay or Simital or some of those those that actually have bigger frames. Um, the more of the English breeds are gear, geared a little more towards quality. Uh, as far as, you know, the meat quality and milking ability, et cetera. Uh, but they can thrive in our environment. There's some other parts of this, you know, the country that they need more Brahmin or Bos Indicus influenced cattle because they're more resistant to heat and bugs. And we don't have as much of that pressure. Um, so Angus base, they do really well here. Uh, we have some that we cross on more of a continental type of an animal because they have a little bit bigger frame. Um, so you, you, know, you can get a little bigger frame, have, have a little more meat, on their bones for, you know, lack of a better term. 
Um, but, you know, because Angus typically they're a little shorter in stature. Uh, they have more propensity to marble, so a little more fat, things like that. Um, but having that balance is, is always a, a good option. Uh, we use steers primarily because um, one of the challenges as far as grazing and feeding is when you have a female that's cycling, you can run into issues, especially like we're surrounded by a lot of different cow herds as well. So we may have neighbor's bulls that come visit when we're running heifers outside. Um, so steers, we alleviate that problem, which is nice. Uh, typically steers, they, they have a larger frame just, you know, from, from the male versus female aspect. So they have a little larger frame, uh, but when you castrate a male, of course, you, you don't run into a lot of the, the toughness issues that you would with a bull. Um, so you have a larger frame, a little more meat on their bones. Um, the, the quality aspect of it is kind of subjective. You know, you have to feed them to their own biological endpoint, which typically a steers is they're heavier, they're heavier weight when they're finished and ready to, to be converted into meat. Um, so, you know, heifers, they do have, their quality grade is typically very good because um, they do have a tendency to lay down more fat naturally than a steer would. Uh, you just run into differences as far as like how much meat that animal will yield. So in my mind, that's the most efficient use that we have of our limited resources is to use an animal that could get you know a little bit bigger. But also, I don't have as much trouble trying to keep them home or trying to keep bulls out of my pastures in the summer. And the feed yard would be the same way because when they're cycling that, that can become a, an issue in, in a feed yard of, you know, they're trying to ride each other, you know, some of the other things that, that come into play, um, and in the hormone side of it. And you just don't have as much of that when it comes to a steer. So. Yeah. And, and I guess, um, you know, I guess the other thing was, you know, it, the, the fat distribution is different between a heifer and a steer. I, I think Jeff was saying that the, the steers tend more intramuscular and the heifers tend to have more visceral fat or subcutaneous fat. Is that, was that what yeah. I was saying? Because um, if they, you know, you get a, a heifer a little too fat, she has a lot more around her internal organs and more back fat versus just the intramuscular, you know, the marbling side of it than a steer would. So and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I've read I read a paper about the fact that the, there's actually a different quality. There's a qualitative difference between where that fat is. And so the intramuscular fat tends to be more sort of mono and saturated base, whereas the subcutaneous fat tends to be more saturated fat. Is that do you know is that true or have you heard it, that? Before? There, there is some research behind that. Um, it's, I don't know that it's scientifically significant, um, but, you know, if we think about what we consume, typically, you know, we're going to be consuming more of that air muscular fat in the marbling versus the, the external fat. Uh, yeah. Depends on who you are. Like, I don't necessarily cut a ton of it off, but a lot of people do. So um, they, you just, it's just more of what you're actually consuming. So yeah, I'm like, if I cook it, I'm eating it, you know, <laughs> you know it's kind of like, if it's on there, I'm, I'm, I'm eating it, when it, and I eat, I eat both, but I, you know, like I said, you like the intermuscular fat. Um, here's a, here's a question, it's kind of a new thing that's come up, and you may have some commentary on this. So, um, there is some, I guess, just approval for this CRISPR technology where they're making cows that are more heat resistant through uh, genetic modifications, um, I, I think they were able to change their coat type. So they, so these cows that normally wouldn't do well in a hot now can tolerate the heat better. Any thoughts on that? Or have you had any experience or any concerns about that? I haven't had any experience personally with it. As I mentioned before, you know, the, the boss indicus breed of cattle, typically that is more inherent, you know, in their DNA and their genetic or their genetic makeup. So that's why they thrive better, you know, in South Texas or far, you know, the far Southeast versus they do up here where we live. Uh, but they do have some genetic differences as far as their meat quality. Um, so that's, that's something that's a, a nuance and why we typically stay away from, from that piece of it. Um, because we don't, we don't have, we don't need those types of breeds, frankly, just because our growing season is so short, our bug pressure is less, our, you know, our environment is as hot. Um, but if we can find ways to, to do that and run different breeds, different places, I, I could see there could be benefit uh, because they, you know, typically, you know, our Angus base, the, the type of cattle we run here do perform better, you know, in the feed yard and typically can, you know, produce a higher quality type of product. So if we can, 
alter that, you know, with, with science, um, there, there may be some benefits there, especially to our producers that live in that part of the world in the Southeast to make sure that they're not getting hit on quality of, of their cattle, um, versus where we live. So. There's a, uh, a question about methane. And I know there's, there's, you know, like I said, one solution is we all turn into vegetarians and vegans, which I think is an incredibly stupid solution, but there's other solutions being uh, put forth through the cattle industry. There's, you know, there's feed additives, you know, these sort of red algae and others that, that, that mitigate methane. There's people like, I know the dairy farmers are now using uh, methane capture technology, like from their lagoons and they're turning it, they're creating natural gas that people utilize. Where do you see, um, I mean, I, I know like the dairy industry has pledged 2015 to be carbon neutral. Are we seeing similar efforts from the beef side? What's going on with regard to that stuff? We definitely are. Uh, I believe it was carbon neutral by 2030, 2030 or 2035. Like they've, they've been aggressive about that as well. Um, basically any sector has been aggressive about that. I mean, even you know, my day job, I work in animal health and, and they've pledged to be carbon neutral as well. Uh, but there's a lot of nuances of what part of the supply chain truly will be carbon neutral. Um, you know, if we're talking about our entire supply chains or are we just talking about, you know, us on our ranch producing our cattle here versus when they get to a processor and then they have all the consumables that go along with converting them into protein. So whether it's the packaging or, you know, the water use that goes along with that or all of our other inputs um, that, that get that product actually to market versus us just producing the product here on the ranch. Uh, but there is actually, there's a group at CSU that is just recently formed and they are, that's what they're focusing their whole research on is all sectors of livestock production on how we increase our sustainability. Um, so dedicating some true research to it and in finding out what things we can do, because at this point uh, there's been small scale advances, but when we look at putting that on, on a large scale of the entire production chain, that's where it becomes either cost prohibitive or uh, just, just not feasible for some other ways. So we're trying to find a more feasible option to do that. Uh, but if you talk about our our day-to-day -day beef producers, we are continuing to advance what we do to become more sustainable. So utilize, you know, moderating our cow size for what we're producing. So, you know, you're moderating your cow size 1,200 pounds and you're weaning a 700 pound calf, your your return on that is is much better than it would be if you had a bigger cow and a smaller calf because they're consuming very similar resources. So if we're putting out more protein for each unit that we're producing, uh, we're, we're moving in the right direction. Yeah. And that's one thing I, I and it's, again, I, I learned all these things over the years, uh, you know, cows can get very, very big. I mean, there's, there's cows out there that are well over 2000 pounds but they don't do well at the processing. So they're not designed to handle them. I think there's like specialized processors up in Wisconsin or something like that. So, I mean, do you, I mean, do you, I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, you, you get them to a certain weight and then you don't want them any bigger, correct? Yes. Yeah. Most ideally. Um, and actually in these large commercial, commercial processing plants, they have, they start hitting you with an overweight fee when you get these carcasses too big. Uh, my last, my knowledge, it was a thousand fifty. So you have a hot carcass weight of over a thousand pounds. And over that is when they start hitting with additional fees. But, and that's been climbing. I mean, even since I started working in industry, I believe it was, it was 850 or 900 pounds prior to, and that's only been 10 years and now it's up to 1050. So, um, but the, the processing capacity, those, those, the rails and things like that, they, they can't handle larger unless they rebuild those plants. Um, so it becomes a, a logistical issue when we start getting cattle way too big. Yeah, I, I had seen somewhere um, that beef production quality is, a, is at an all time high, at least in the United States. So that means more cattle are, are grading out at choice or, or above or uh, prime instead of select and below. Um, is that consistent with what your experience has been? You see more and more cattle are more easily, I guess you're just getting better at it. I mean, which makes sense, right? Yes, yes. We're, I believe it was 80 or 85% um, choice and prime you know, across the entire chain. So we continue to improve as far as that goes. There's less and less what we call plain cattle or select cattle all the time. 
the quality grade is is continually getting better. And then on the processing side, because you guys are, you know, you have Colorado Craft, which is kind of your, your flagship high-end direct-to-consumer, I guess. And then you have another herd that's kind of more in the commodity market, I guess. That's, I think, how Jeff explained it to me. Uh, but are you, um, you know, what are your thoughts around the processing bottlenecks? Because that was a big topic, you know, the last two years about, you know, food supply and everybody's talking about food shortages and one of the issues was we didn't have enough processing time or facility. And I've, I've seen a lot of, like a lot of ranchers say, I can't get my cows processed. Are you, do you, are you aware of that? Or do you see any problems with that? Uh, yes, that's been an interesting dynamic, uh, even since I started in industry, because we had two large processors that I believe they could kill at least like 6,000 a day or around there, that when I first started in industry, they, they closed because they did not have enough cattle to kill. So that was around... 2010, 2014 or so in there. Um, so that was that was an interesting piece of it is our cattle cycles had changed so much that they didn't have enough fed cattle to run through these processing plants. So that kind of leveled out the supply when those large plants closed down. Uh, but now we've rebuilt, we've rebuilt our herd. So we have more cattle to be able to process. And then COVID, that was a whole different breed of cat. It wasn't necessarily the pro, you know, the we call it shackle space. It wasn't that. It was more of the logistical side of actually getting them processed because the people, you know, we didn't have enough people to be able to run the plants. They had to slow the lines down. And then the, the transportation piece of it, of actually getting that meat to where it needed to go was a big bottleneck. Um, so we're, we're relatively flat. We've probably moved to the other side of we need some more processing capacity on the commercial chain right now, uh, but there's a lot of them that are, are planning to come online. So they saw that during COVID and they're like, well, we need more capacity. So there's at least two or three plants that I know of that are planning to be online between now and two years from now. Um, so they're, they're rebuilding that, but we may end up in the same space that we were a few years ago of we don't have enough cattle to run through these plants. And then that's, you know, when the leverage switches from the packer back to the, the rancher, basically. So it's always that kind of fluctuating dynamic of, of where the leverage lies and it's the supply and demand situation. Do you, I mean, do you see the, the leverage going back to the rancher? And I know, I know a lot of ranchers are, are really struggling with, you know, the, the fact the price, I know the, the way the pricing system is, you know, they just tell you what your cattle is going to be worth. You have no idea going in and they tell you your cattle's worth this. And when, when it's ready to be harvested, it's ready to be harvested and you don't really have a choice in there. You can't keep them around for another six months. It's like, you got to sell them now. And so do you see any, any uh, uh, realistic change to that system coming in? I know there's some law legislation being put, passed and some things that I can't remember, like 50, 20, 14, 50 or something. I don't remember the name of the laws, but I know there's, there's several people that are looking at that. Do you see any any uh, any likely change? In the short term, uh, we we may be hard pressed to change. Uh, but one one of the wonderful things at least is the the board, the Chicago Merc Mercantile Ex Exchange. So basically, that's how you're pricing a commodity has been strong, especially compared to how it was in COVID. So that was one of the issues is that tanked along with all the other markets. So what these packers would bid was only what the board told them that really they had to pay. And that was like a dollar a pound uh, or less than that. But now, you know, we're trading in like the 130. So at least we're, we're in a better space than we were. And that that has helped. But we we could use more competition, frankly. You know, when you have big four packers and those are the only ones that are bidding, the, the, the price discovery isn't quite like we'd like it to be from a live cattle side. And that trickles all the way down to, you know, to the cow calf guy, because that's, that's where that money has to come from. <laughs> it starts there and then moves all the way into where they're converted into, into beef. But there's other ways that you can help capture some premiums when you're producing high quality cattle uh, and you could sell them on, on the grid, we call it, to where they're, they're capturing the premium of how they do in the meat versus just selling them as a live, you know, sheer weight price. Um, so there's, there's ways that we can, can do better and capitalize on some of the premiums of the quality cattle that we're producing. Yeah. One of the, and I guess uh, I saw somebody said there was, a, there was a, they're violating the packers and stockyard laws in the 1920s or something like that with the price, the collusion, the price fix. And so, I mean, that's all, 
allegations and stuff like that is probably happening, but you know, there's, I know there's been a lot of uh, uh, gnashing of teeth around that. Do you, um, you know, and I know Wyoming was, you know, I used to live in Wyoming. I lived in Cheyenne. And so I'm very familiar with that Northern Greeley area where you guys aren't far from. Um, and I know that Wyoming recently passed a law, okay, the Food Freedom Act or something like that allows ranchers to basically sell small, even, I can't remember how it was, but it was something different that we can't do in other states. Are you familiar with that? And is there any, does that impact you in Colorado? Is there anything similar to that going on in Colorado? So it, that if, if I'm remembering correctly, it's, it allows them to sell across state lines. Um, and that is where the, the USDA stamp comes into play of that's how we're able to ship across state lines is we have the USDA certification on all of our beef. Um, you know, and, and to me, that's something that's important to me. I've, I've spent time in the, in the processing industry and I, it's not to say that other places aren't of quality because that's not the case. It's just that kind of added added layer, and for us, the added assurity to our customers that we're we're making sure that we're we're doing everything the, the highest quality we can. Um, so that's that can change things though because the the pricing side of that's very different. You know, if you're if you're just processing for yourself on one of these small processors the cost to process is way less than it is when you have the USDA certification. So then you run into some, some competition issues of, well, this, this meat could be priced at this because it took them a fraction of what it took us to get it to market because of the differences in pricing from a processor, because they have to have that certification, you know, and some of the, the things that go along with that is it costs more to have meat processed under a USDA certification than it does of one that's just custom exempt. Um, Cause typically that custom exempt was you could process your own for you. Um, or you could sell a live animal to your neighbor and they could go get it processed for them versus actually selling that meat and then going across state lines with it is, is a whole nother deal because that becomes federal versus just state. Yeah, and uh, so I guess Wyoming allows you to, you, to, you can, they, they can export their meat out of state without a USDA facility, I guess, is what it sounds like. I believe that's the case. It's either that or they could still retail it in state uh, because technically to retail, you need to have a USDA license as well. So uh, if they're retailing it in state, um, I believe they're, they're able to do that without a USDA certification on their, on their meat. There's a question from Charlie. I think Charlie, I think he has cattle or something. Like that. He seems to know a lot about cattle, but he's asking about the Angus seem to have better te a, a calm temperament. Is that what you see? Are they pretty calm animals? In in a lot of ways, yes. Um, you know, I've seen I've seen good, bad, and ugly with with all of them, <laughs> but in general, they are a little more calm tempered, um, have a little more of eternal traits. Um, some of those things stay pretty pretty in line with breed specific uh, but we all have you know our own bad actors on occasion so <laughs> um, but yes that's and some of those things can lead into a meat quality side as well of you know the, the temperament of cattle and from from our perspective you know if you're calving out a cow that wants to eat your lunch that's yeah that's not enjoyable you don't want that and it becomes a, a safety risk for yourself as well as you know, maybe your employees and, and those types of things. And typically they pass that on to their heifers and then you perpetuate that. So you'd rather have ones that have a little more of a, a calm temperament. Yeah, I mean, I think I saw somewhere that cows are, are among the top 10 deadliest animals on earth. There's like when it comes to the number of people killed every year, cows are in the top 10. And I think it's just because there's so many cows and so many cow human interactions where you right. know, they're big animals. And obviously if they decide to, to run you over, you, there's not much you can do about it, I guess, you know. Have, you ever, been, have you ever been knocked over by a cow or anything like that? Or... <laughs> <laughs> my, my dad, he, uh, one, of, one of his like favorite lines is, you know, when we're sorting, he's like, hold your ground. I'm like, well, I'm, you know, only eight years old and there's only so much I can do. I can only look so big, so, <laughs> uh, yes. Do you, um, uh, what was I going to say here? Um, as far as, uh, oh, there's a question about um, another question in here. Somebody had that I missed. Oh, yeah. Okay. So we're told that cattle are the largest contributor of global warming 
or the third most or the second most, <laughs> uh, according to sort of these sort of plant-based advocates. Uh, what are your thoughts around that? Uh, the cows destroying the planet and stuff like that. What, what, what is the data that you have access to show? I'll, I'll have to pull some some actual numbers for you. Um, you know, the, the thought, of course, within the industry is is yes, there there are methane production. You know, that that is a piece of a cow because of their internal makeup. Um, so they are belching methane. Uh, the the ability of that to contribute to climate change, I think, is still not really well known. Um, so if we're just looking at total emissions. Uh, the you know the uptake as you mentioned of of methane from our our biological critters uh, I wouldn't say is is as detrimental as some of you know that may, maybe factory or et cetera you know from some other place uh, because biology was designed a specific way for a specific reason uh, is is the way I feel about it but you know of course I'm I'm biased in that of the the benefits that we get from cattle production you know from our health but also the the carbon that we're able to sequester I feel like completely balances out the other piece of it where we are um, you know there may be other places where that might not be the case uh, you know whether they don't consume the the cattle that are you know there um, you know in some some Hindu countries the same that's the way it is they're they're just not consumed so you know maybe that's just a carbon sink but when we balance out how much carbon is actually sequestered in the ground from these animals compared to the emissions, uh, we're, we're in a lot better space, um, you know, because we're actually, we're truly giving back to, to the environment and, and the ground versus just a total carbon sink. So let me ask you just another question about production, because I, you know, I obviously I've had a lot of your, your meat and I think it's wonderful. It tastes really, really good. Just you guys who are some good meat, Colorado Craft has some great meat, but Jeff was saying it was something, it was just as much about feeding and finishing as it was about how it's processed. The, the processing actually has a, has a very important part to do with, with how the flavor turns out. And some of that is how long it's hung. Can you speak a little bit about that, about how it's processed? It gives it a unique sort of flavor. You bet. The, the meat processing side is, is huge. You know, that, there is special care taken from when that animal is produced or is changed into our protein that, that we're producing. Uh, the, there's, there's so much science that happens at that point. Um, and one of the biggest things that we do differently is we do age. So we age that the carcass whole for 21 days. So you have an enzymatic breakdown so that increases tenderness and it, it, it comes to that, that dry age flavor, that robust flavor that, that you'd be accustomed to with any of, of our beef. And, and we're able to do that, which we cannot do in our commercial chain uh, because we're, you know, we're processing five to 6,000 head a day. Um, so you can't put the, you don't have a hot box big enough to put all of those whole carcasses in, you know, back to back to back. So they have to get them fabbed and get out of there. You know, five days is a big amount of time for them to get them fabbed and put into a box and go somewhere else. And we're hanging them whole, you know, half carcasses for 21 days. And that makes a very, very big difference as far as the meat science and the meat quality goes. Uh, but our, our finishing side, you know, when you, when you have an animal that gets to the appropriate biological endpoint, that, that makes a big difference to start with. But from a sheer meat science side, uh, that would be one of the biggest things. And there is so much that you can do with a knife um, that, that makes, makes a difference in appearance and, you know, your eating experience when, when that actually gets to you in a package. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's an interesting part of that, you know, and, and I think I, I, I guess, I thought that, you know, it was custom to, to hang meat for a couple of weeks, typically in the U.S., but I guess it turns out that that time has been compressed quite a bit because, like you said, there's not the space and time for all these huge number of cattle to go through, so you get a quicker quicker experience there. Um, there is a, another question about uh, dealing with parasites, as far as you said there wasn't a big bug issue, so I assume the parasite issue is also less where you're at, but how do you, do, how do you handle parasites? So with our cattle, we, we deworm. I mean, the, you don't want to have a parasite load. That, that Parasites basically just keep that animal from reaching their genetic potential. Um, so those parasites are consuming the limited amount of resources that we have for, for them to be able to consume. So we, we will treat all of our, our cattle for parasites to make sure that they're parasite free. 
Yeah, that's one of the things I've, I've heard. I've, I think I talked to Frank Mitloner. I'm sure you're familiar with Frank out at UC Davis. And he was talking about, you know, in India, because they have such a heavy parasite burden in their, in their, in their sort of native population, they've got, you know, 200 plus million head of cattle, one of the largest, I think they have the largest cattle herd in the world, if not them, or Brazil. And they're so inefficient because they're all sick from parasites and they can't produce milk very well. And they don't, you know, the, the meat they do produce is, takes a lot longer to produce. And so it is a, it is an issue. Let me ask you, this is another thing that I often, a lot of people will say, you know, I don't want any of that antibiotic hormone meat because it's, it's awful. It's going to, it's going to make, give me all kinds of health problems if I eat it. And what are the, what is the reality of antibiotic utilization when it comes to, 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 to the, to the, to the cattle and then around slaughter and the same thing with hormone production or utilization rather? So with any antibiotics that we have labeled for cattle, they all have a labeled withdrawal time. So that's the, the time from when that animal was administered that antibiotic to where that would be clear out of their system to be able to be processed for meat. Um, and that's across the board. That's all of them have a specific withdrawal time and all of, you know, records are keep are kept to make sure that all these cattle are, you know, what we call clear when they would go to process. The likelihood of them being close to that is still relatively low. Um, so for example, you know, if we have a calf that was sick, it's, you know, six months of age and we had to give it an antibiotic and the withdrawal time on that was 21 days, you know, their, their end of life would be closer to, you know, the 18 to 24 months of age. So even just the, the sheer lifespan would be negligible um, from when that antibiotic was given. The, the likelihood of it being given close to end of life is relatively low unless that animal has something chronically wrong with it. Um, but typically there is that situation wouldn't be of concern. Uh, but even if it is, we, we have all of these things that are FDA regulated with withdrawal times for a reason uh, to make sure that that's, that's not in, in the animal and in meat when they go to process. Yeah, it's my understanding if, if an animal does show up to processor and it's tested and it flags positive for antibiotic, the, the meat is rejected or and the, the rancher suffers some sort of penalty from that. Is that, is that what happens? Yeah, you get a letter from FDA and that's not a good day. I mean, all of these, you know, whether it's a, a you're a feed yard or, you know, somebody that, that's selling cattle in the meat, you you get one red, 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 red letter from FDA, it's a bad deal. You, I believe it's two then they're no longer going to take cattle from you. It's two or three. So if you're if you're a repeat offender, your your cattle are no longer going into the meat production chain. Um, it's it's not a it's not just a slap on the wrist. It's it's a bad situation. Um, but something that a lot of people don't realize is those tests are typically taken in target issue or target tissues. So whether it's kidney or liver, places where those antibiotics are metabolized. You know, so if they're not showing up there, the likelihood of them showing up in the actual meat is very, very low. Um, so you're testing the target tissues of where that antibiotic would have been metabolized anyways. Um, so there's there's kind of a misconception about that is there's we have extra safeguards also. So it's it's those target tissues that are being tested. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't eat meat to, to treat my to, to to treat myself for an infection. There's not going to be any. You're not going to eat any antibiotics from it. Let me ask you about this. Is the other thing you know you mentioned? I guess on the on the sort of the, the commercial side, most cattle, like you said, 18, 24 months, something like that. Some maybe even 16 months, depending on I guess mm -hmm. the processor. Um, a lot of people would say, well, that's an unnaturally short lifespan, and that. A cow would normally live to be 15, 20 years or something like that. This is sort of the, in fact, there was a, there was a, uh, a proposal, I think both in Oregon and in Colorado, which you're probably aware of that Jared Paulus and some of the people proposed, there was, I don't think it got on the ballot, but it, but it was, but they're saying that, you know, because these cows would normally live to be 15 years, you, you shouldn't be able to slaughter them until they reach 25% of that or 30%, which would be, you know, four years or something like, which would be, you know, very financially difficult for a rancher. But what is the reality of a, of a cow living to 20 years in the wild? I mean, would that be, would that be something that you think would happen? No, frankly, especially not where we are. Uh, they start losing their teeth. 
that's that's what happens you know we call them broken mouth cows is as soon as they start losing their teeth and then they are not able to use the forage that's available then they just essentially starve to death which is a really bad bad way to go um and that's where a lot of ranchers start to cull their cows when they start losing their teeth so they become you know we call them gummer mouth cows um and typically you know i mean gosh 12 is really old for for a beef cow um you know there's some that could live longer if they've lived a very blessed life of you know just really easily accessible forage and never went anywhere and oh there we are um so they but typically that that lifespan would be shorter than that um and we're talking you know our, our reproductive our beef cow herd uh, what we produce for the highest quality beef that you could find on grocery store shelves or coming from us is that young beef that you know under 30 months of age and the reason that is is physiologically that meat starts to become tougher and changes the flavor profile um, and there's just scientifically things that happen when they get over that age that makes that not as good of an eating experience you know these the younger animals is where your highest quality beef is going to come from hands down yeah i guess that's one of the one of the criticisms on the grass finishing beef is that it takes longer and so these animals are now 36 months or sometimes even a little older and i've seen some that are much older than that and it's harder to because the energy concentration is not um, as like you said, is available, so it's harder for them to lay down the marbling or the intramuscular fat, which gives it that flavor profile. But there are some I've had some really good, flavorful, juicy, well marbled uh, grass finished animals before. And it's just a matter of what they're, I guess, the forage quality and what they've got. So it's so it's doable. But I and, and again, you guys aren't interested in in a grass finished product. Is that correct? We at this point, it just doesn't work well for our environment. Um, you know, we we've had some some conversations around it of you know if we truly had a crop side to where you could graze some of those, you know, whether it was peas or you know some of those have a little higher energy content, uh, but we that just doesn't work very well for us um, as far as our situation. So, um, and our we feel like from our the resources we have available, the most efficient use of it is, is a, a grain finish scenario. What is a, I remember Jeff said, you guys, you've got some sort of bigger plans coming up. What is the, what is the, what are the plans for Colorado craft over the next couple of years or, or, the, or the ranching business? I think, I think some good things were happening. I don't know. Are you willing to share that or talk about what's going on? Uh, not quite yet, but but hopefully soon we will be able to to talk about that. Um, you know, just looking on how we we look a little more, you know, integrated possibly, um, and and some of the other sectors. So, all right. Well, I'll tell you what, Kara. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to go here in a couple of minutes. So I've got to do some. I got some more meetings and stuff. And I see somebody pulling in my driveway. So my dogs are about to go into the lipstick here in a second. But where do people go to 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 to, to get some Colorado craft beef? Where can they find out more about learning about agriculture and that type of stuff? If you want to share those, perfect. The easiest way is just go to ColoradoCraftBeef.com. Um, you'll reach out there. You'll either get myself or my husband. Uh, if you have any specific questions, you know, on cattle production, I'd be happy to talk through those. Uh, you could send me an email. So it's Kara K A R A at Colorado Craft Beef. And how are you guys stocked? Are you guys got plenty of beef to, to get people? Or what? <laughs> yes. Yep. We're good. So um, everything right now is readily available and um, yeah, we're, we're continuing on. So. All right. Well, so I, I bought a second chest freezer the other day just because I actually got a local cow and I'd already filled up my fr my, fr my other freezer with beef. And I was like, Oh crud. Now the cow's here and I don't have a place to put it. So I had to get a second freezer. It was a good problem to have. I got to tell you guys, yep. it, feels, it feels a lot better when, when you got, meat in the freezer and it's full and uh only i guess the next thing i know is i got to get a generator because sometimes we have power outages and that's a pain that's Kara, thank you so much uh appreciate it say hi to jeff and the kiddos and keep doing the great job you're doing and keep making that wonderful stuff i tell you i want to just just encourage as many ranches as possible to, to keep doing it let you know you're appreciated because you truly are and it's something that uh we just we just need to keep this valuable resource available for for generations to come thank you so much Appreciate it. All right, guys. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Everybody take care. Bye-bye now.